Good morning and happy Monday to you. You're tuned in to BQ Prime. This is Straight Talk. My name is Alex Matthew and with me is Hiral Dadia. Morning, Hiral. Good morning, Alex. You, you seem know, to be absolutely <laughs> fresh after a vacation. You know, I, I, I hesitate to say this because I think all of our viewers will wish that I go on leave more often. But uh, since the time that I went on leave, the Nifty 50 is up over 500 points. And uh, in fact, is trading at an all-time high. And it continues to breach new highs every day. Absolutely. And I think the key highlight over here today, uh, as you come in as well on a Monday morning, is where gift nifty yeah. Alex starts trading as well. I was going to say I trade every day uh, okay. as a gift. And you stole my line, kind of. Uh, so the gift nifty is trading, as you know, today. Uh, or rather, it has been trading for some time. But the SGX nifty is now called the gift nifty. And all of those trades that were originating out of Singapore uh, uh, through the SGX uh, in, uh, exchange uh, that uh, trade in derivatives in India uh, are now shifting to gift in Ahmedabad. Yeah, and, and what's going to be interesting over here is the way the Sensex was called the sensitive index, Alex, whether gift <laughs> nifty will actually probably be coined as gifty. I mean, whether that's going to take due course or not for ease of pronunciation is something that we need to wait we'll have to see maybe, maybe our viewers can tell us what they think about gifty and how that sounds a uh, gift nifty is what it is as of now though absolutely and what will happen is though it will remain out of reach of indian retailers as well due to the rules by the rbi uh, so that's something we need to wait and watch but all derivative contracts were little over nearly 7.5 billion dollars uh, which were traded in singapore will actually shift to india's gift city so you have you know contracts of gift nifty 50 Gift Nifty Bank, Gift Nifty Financial Services, and, yeah. and Gift Nifty IT. So these are the ones which will shift. Absolutely. And, you know, apart from the Gift Nifty and the fact that it's currently indicating a positive start, uh, gains of about a tenth of a percent or thereabouts, uh, we are at elevated levels. So the question I think a lot of people are asking, not just in India, but globally, is whether we've you know, ratcheted up quite quickly, whether we're going to see selling pressure, that we'll wait and see. But the focus, I think, this week, uh, once again, uh, after that July 1st date for HDFC, HDFC Bank becomes HDFC Bank. Absolutely. And whether the HDFC twins will be the ones who will be supporting the index or not, because clearly the combined market cap becomes, uh, you know, over above, over and above TCS as well. So it becomes the second biggest entity if you have to just do a, a one plus one, though Reliance is still number one. Now, what happens in terms of weightage and how it impacts the nifty movements mm. is something we need to be Certainly. See. And 14.6 lakh crore, just going by Friday's close, that's a rough estimate of where the combined market capitalization would stand at. It becomes the fourth largest of the fourth most valuable bank in the world based on market capitalization and a few very stellar names on that list. But let's talk about the fundamentals of this bank as well. And there are a lot of tailwinds that uh, analysts are, are pointing to that will emerge for HDFC Bank with that merger. Of course, the uh, key dates that you want to bear in mind, uh, there are a few that you need to know about. 13th of July is uh, going to be the record date for the holders of HDFC for the allot all uh, allotment of HDFC Bank shares. And uh, 17th tentatively is the date when you could see the merged entity trading. We're joined by Deepan Mehta, the founder and director at Elixa Equities, uh, just to get a sense of things uh, for the merged entity. And we've been talking about this, Deepan, for a while. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. What are your initial thoughts about the merged entity? There are points being made about uh, positives as far as cost to income ratio and various other aspects are concerned. Yeah, good morning and thank you for having me on your show. Today indeed is a momentous day uh, because you know we've been following the SGX Nifty early in the morning for so many decades, I would say, yeah. at least more than 20 years. And now we are having a situation where actually we'll be following the gift Nifty in the morning. And I had an I had a shortcut for gift Nifty and I thought it should be called the genie because uh, I think that's more catchy and it does signify uh, as a aura of wealth around it which is what this is all about, creating value for the Indian stock market. So congratulations to NSC on that. But coming specifically to HDFC, HDFC Bank, I think another momentous uh, event taking place in the financial services banking space and the creation of such a large bank is certainly, I think, uh, going to be a big impact on the banking sector per se. I've always been in favor of the merger. I think we need more and more stronger banks in India. 
as the economy grows and the uh, credit in demand increases, credit requirement increases, I think stronger the bank, the safer it is for the deposit holders as well as for the minority shareholders. And maybe not in the first one or two quarters or so, but gradually you will see a lot of synergy effects coming in. Uh, there are many HDFC customers who are not uh, uh, customers of HDFC Bank. And HDFC Bank has a large network, which I didn't, I didn't think they were actively following up or pushing the home loan product. But now that certainly will change. And overall, I think the competitiveness in the home loan space should increase. So I think we need to look at the competitors also in uh, under more uh, more uh, scrutinized light. Having said that, I think it's a great moment, and maybe the underperformance which we have seen in both these companies could get reversed from this point on. Right, uh, Deepan. Good morning, Hiral on the side. Uh, you know, we've got two words already that we've coined in terms of gift nifty. One is gitty, and one is. Uh, gifty that we've looked at. Let's see what others come up with on this. But moving apart from there on HDFC again, now clearly if you see, you know, I mean, Shashi Jagdishan came out and said over the weekend that we could be creating a new HDFC bank every four years. Uh, taking commentary from the management into consideration and seeing the way the twins have been moving, the stock price performance has been pretty much in tandem. Now, from a fundamental perspective, how are you looking at growth of the combined entity? Do you see some bit of moderation that could come in specifically if you, if you have to look uh, from a price to earnings as well as a price to uh, book consideration? See, I think uh, valuations are fair. The challenge is the base effect. I think when Mr. Jagdishan says he wants to grow, the, he wants to create a HDFC bank every four years which means he's targeting 18% type of growth rates. And while that has been historically uh, true, he has been able to clock that high um, high teens kind of growth rates. I don't know at such a base effect, uh, whether how long that is sustainable. So, but anyway, I think it's great news for shareholders like us. A disclosure, we and our clients are invested in HDFC and HDFC Bank. I think who isn't is the question we have to ask over here. Uh, so I think it's it's a great target. And it's not a it's not a guidance as I understand, but certainly in this country it is possible uh, because you have the GDP at nominal rates or other at market prices growing in the 10, 11, 12 percent type of a range, and overall bank credit uh, does grow at one and a half times the GDP, and then HDFC uh, bank combined uh, certainly will grow faster than some of the PSU banks and some of the other smaller banks. So from that point of view. It is theoretically possible for HDFC bank combined to grow at that 18% plus type of a growth rate. And mind you, if they do that, uh, you know, can you imagine what kind of uh, uh, returns that they can generate? Because even if you assume that the price to earning price to book remains constant, that's the minimum return that you can expect because 18% growth in um, credit will translate to around the same uh, level uh, at the uh, bottom line uh, for the company. And mind you, their NPA management has been fantastic. I've never seen a quarter where NPAs have gone completely out of control and resulted in a sharply lower net profit growth as compared to credit growth. So I think uh, uh, it's a great investment for, from a, from a long-term perspective. And as I said, I think a lot of funds, uh, a lot of uh, investors anyway have HDFC Bank in their portfolio and now all the more reason. Also, I think it's weightage in all the indices is going to move up. So from a benchmarking perspective also, uh, one needs to have an investment in HDFC Bank. Okay, so uh, Deepan, uh, on the valuations point, you've said that it's fair, and based on the run rate that the company is projecting, that's uh, you know what you've already laid out what could potentially happen. But I'm curious about what you think about uh, what the multiples could be once those synergies come into play. Do you think that they will have to be shifted upwards? I'm talking about the the forward multiples, and what uh, what are you ascribing to it? See, I think it's it's no longer the most expensive bank. We know that. It's no longer the most expensive lender also. We know that as well. And uh, it had a uh, premium valuation, but now I think they are more or less in line with its peer group. And if growth rates are at these levels, I think certainly there is scope to re-rate the price to earnings, price to book multiple on the higher side. I think market forces also have a very important role to play over here. And uh, if on the whole we see good demand coming in, uh, an attractive, uh, you know, a, a good demand coming in from overseas investors and all these uncertainties about um, about the allocation and about the weightage in all the indices. Once that is kind of over and done with all those adjustments, 
I think there certainly is a case for uh, re-rating of the price to earning, price to book multiple. Right. Deepan, apart from this, you know, this is what we're talking of the merged entity. Now, clearly one portfolio of the from HDFC that gets impacted is the construction, uh, you know, finance portfolio, because as per RBI rules as well, you will see banks who will not be able to lend uh, to builders as well, right? How do you see that gap, you know, that gets created in the market and what's your view on that space? I think it's a very narrow market and uh, we're not really concerned about that. In any case, I think a lot of the lenders are moving away from that segment given how much pain it has caused to the industry in the past. So I don't think it's much of an issue. Uh, more importantly, I think we need stronger and larger banks like HDS, HD Bank, like the HDC Bank combined uh, to drive uh, growth to the corporate sector. I think what we're not realizing is that we are seeing a super uh, cycle building up on the CAPEX side. And uh, a lot of industries, a lot of companies are going in for expansion. The requirement for working capital and actual asset purchases will go up. And these are big ticket lending assignments, which only a large bank like HDFC Bank can take the risk, evaluate, and then uh, you know lend to such companies. So that I think is going to be a major competitive advantage. And the minor kind of uh, you know compromises which the bank may have to make, uh, the combined entity we may have to make, I think those are not not very important or not very material at this point of time. It's just the fact that the balance sheet size, the capital adequacy ratio, the network, the technology, the spread, the brand, I think all of that is going to make a huge difference in terms of uh, managing this kind of 18% uh, type of targeted growth rate. Okay. Uh, last question, and this is a bit of a technicality, and I'm guessing this pertains to a lot of our viewers. Uh, you mentioned this is a widely held, uh, or these two are widely held stocks. I think there are a lot of retail investors that hold small number of these shares. So what happens to those that are holding a, maybe just a handful, five or six shares of HDFC, for example? How does the merger work for them? And would you have uh, a recommendation to take a fresh position, if at all, into the merged entity? Yeah, of course. I think you should get to that magic number, which gives you one share of uh, HDFC bank. No doubt about that. But uh, there are ways and means of tackling this thing. I think um, companies tend to give a cash payout for such uh, small holdings as well. That's been done in the past. Uh, and you could also be having fractional shares. That also, I think, is permitted. I'm not the complete expert on the merchant banking side. But there are ways and means of working it around. Coming specifically to your question, whether investors who do not have adequate position or adequate uh, weightage of HDFC, HDFC bank in their portfolio, they must do so at this point of time. And, uh, you know, it's just a matter of uh, being patient. I know the stock has underperformed for the past uh, two, three years or so, but um, I'm betting that uh, that trend will reverse going forward. Having said that, I want to make a disclosure here that it's not a recommendation to buy HDFC or HDFC Bank at this point. And every investor must do their due diligence. Our views are slightly biased because we have already invested in the stock and one should keep that in mind. I think a lot of people that we speak to will have to give that disclosure. Thank you so much, Deepan, for taking the time. Pleasure speaking with you. All right. Now, so that's uh, effectively quite a lot of what you need to know about HDFC and HDFC Bank. Of course, we'll be talk talking about it a lot more over the course of the coming week. And we'll do uh, a special session so that you can ask your questions. In the meanwhile, let's turn to the other stocks that you need to bear in mind. Uh, the auto pack as a whole is going to be in focus today because over the weekend you saw the latest dispatch data that was released by a lot of these companies. Sajit is joining in to give us some perspective on that. Good Sajid, morning, Alex. Good morning. Uh, and uh, so if I can pick up in one line, I would say that the biggest CV maker has disappointed just a little bit. The biggest two-wheeler maker has disappointed just a little bit. And the biggest PV maker has, in fact, uh, registered a growth. Is that a rough uh, yeah, that? I mean, uh, you you look if you look at it from a perspective of how how it's happening on the retail level as well. Mm -hmm. So in June, uh, the entire uh, retail sales have been much uh, you know sluggish as compared to May. Uh, I was just looking at some of the numbers. It's uh, coming to you know 18 uh, odd lakhs of total units of uh, registration that happened in June compared to 20 plus 20.3 lakhs happening in May. So there is a sluggishness which has come in in June, uh, you know, and that's uh, you know getting 
reflected in the dispatches as well for two two wheeler makers as well because hero or uh, you know we saw a decline of 8.7 percent in dispatches uh that could be because of the inventory which is already there and there is uh you know move to destock them and then refill it with new one before the next uh, season comes in which is in uh September, October, November, because the uh, uh, because because the next festive season uh, begins in that period. There, so you're going to go uh, see that CV uh, is continues to be a little uh, challenging. The higher end CVs are getting sold, but the lower end ones, uh, lower uh, com um, uh, light commercial vehicles, are not getting sold, and that's getting reflected in the numbers. Uh, we will see that uh, happening in Ashok Leyland. Also, we saw that uh, in uh, Tata Motors, where the LCV numbers are uh, we have dragged down the entire CV uh, numbers, but uh, passenger vehicles have gone up by nearly 5%. Hero Moto, as I said, the entry-level bike bikes are not getting picked up. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the sales have declined upon 8.7%. Uh, Hero also came out with uh, some uh, bit of uh, analyst, uh, you know, meet a couple of weeks back, or a couple of days back, actually, actually, where they articulated their game plan for the coming year, where they're going to launch Pulsar, and they're going to come out with higher-end vehicles, and there's more increase in number of outlets for not only EV, but also for uh, two-wheeler makers there. Aisha Motor, uh, domestic sales uh, of commercial arms has, uh, you know, risen by 12.4%, uh, but exports have fallen. But again, Aisha Motor has, is in the higher end of CV, so that's where it is there. But uh, but the motorcycles uh, sales have rose, uh, risen, which is Royal Enfield has risen 26%. So you're seeing a good pickup happening, good sales happening at the higher end of the motorcycle or two-wheeler makers there. Hyundai again saw a uh, rise of nearly 2%, but, uh, you know, exports have fallen there. And Maruti uh, continues to be, you know, driven by the SUV sales, which have driven, uh, uh, you know, which went up by nearly 300% for SUV, and that le led to an overall uh, sales growth of, 5.8 percent to 1.4 lakh, though export fell in the month of June for the right. America. And and with this, Sajid, what's going to be interesting to watch out for for the two-wheeler space is what Bajaj Auto reports as well, because for Hero Motor, if you see uh, month on month, year on year, and YTD, we've seen a degrowth. In addition, they've taken a price hike already now of a percent and a half. So, what is that trend going to actually give us? Whether it's a trend in the two-wheeler segment where we are seeing a degrowth, or is it only Hero Moto in terms of the domestic markets, which are seeing a degrowth, because that will clearly tell us how the stock could be impacted in opening. Uh, Friday session, we did see a two, two and a half percent up move on the counter. That's true. But, you know, you look at uh, from an industry point of view to get a perspective, we're seeing EV sales hitting uh, one lakh a month. Okay. okay. Uh, of that 50 percent is two wheelers and 50 percent is three wheelers, which is coming in. And within uh, EV sales, we have seen uh, one third going to Ola, uh, which is uh, which is 17 or thousand. And this I'm, this, I'm not talking about the registrations part of it. I'm not talking from the dispatches mm -hmm. point of view. Uh, so we're seeing some kind of the uh, lower end motorcycles, which 100 cc or something, getting replaced you know replaced by, by EV, which, which is, is there, heroes market, which which is heroes market, which okay. is, which is there, and uh, others as well. So so though there's no. If you ask the analysts, they will say, oh, there's no firm trend coming in. But it seems like that, you know, the inflection point is reaching to that level where the lower end uh, motorcycles are getting replaced by electric vehicles and uh, which gives you the same speed and uh, efficiency and better efficiency because of the fuel uh, yeah. saving, which is, which is there. So th uh, that trend is happening. Uh, it's very difficult to pinpoint it, but... Uh, the rising sales above 1 lakh per month for EVs is now going to eat into at least the lower end of the uh, motorcycles. motorcycles. Yes, right. So I think that entire pack is going to be important to watch out for in today's session. So watch out for the two-wheeler two space. Thank you, Sajid, for getting us the details as well. Watch out for the two-wheeler space pretty closely, specifically with Hero Motor, which has already reported numbers. Bajaj is something that we will be eyeing. But now that we are just pretty close to the earnings season, uh, 12 July is when TCS starts reporting numbers. We have companies which have actually started giving out uh, their quarterly and their monthly business updates as well. Uh, Rishi is joining us to get us more. Rishi, a lot of companies, you have an Ultratech, NTPC, a lot of other metal companies as well. Uh, what is that indicating from a trend perspective? 
So if you look at APL Apollo Tubes, it came out with its quarterly update. So it had it reported the highest ever quarterly sales volume of 661 million tons, uh, which was a 56% growth year on year. Then we also have its general structures, which grew 70% year on year in the first quarter. But if you also look at the other side, that is the value added products, its share also increased to 57% from 54% that was seen in the previous quarter. Now, the company also expects to continue this trend uh, of decommoditization, as it calls it, and also expects to improve the sales mix uh, with more and more value added products coming into the play. Now, then there is Ultratex Events, uh, which reported consolidated sales. Uh, so, the consolidated sales it grew over uh, 20%, but it fell, uh, it grew 20% year on year, but it fell 5% uh, as compared to the previous quarter. Now, with respect to ge geographies, it's India sales. Uh, stood at 29 million tons and it grew 20% with almost 98% coming from gray cements. Now, if you look at this overseas sales, which, which is again predom predominantly gray cement, uh, it grew 11% year on year and its capacity utilization stood at all, approximately 90%. Now, coming to the mining and power sector, uh, NTPC had a coal production of 8.48 million tons, which almost doubled with a growth rate of 99%. And also coal dispatch, uh, which almost which more than doubled to 8.82 million tons. Now, there's also Coal India, which came out with its monthly as well as quarterly numbers. So, with respect to its June uh, production, it was at 58 million tons, which grew 12.4% year on year. And its offtake or the supplies uh, was at 61 million tons, uh, which grew 3.6% year on year. Now, coming to its quarter quarterly numbers, its production was at 175.5 million tons, and its offtake was at 187 million tons. Now, its newly appointed chairman, uh, PM Prasad, he said he announced that uh, CL would give its best with respect to uh, achieving its target of 780 million tons of uh, output in this uh, in FY24. Now, there's also NMDC. Uh, it recorded the highest ever June month as well as the first quarter production and sales uh, in the company's entire history. So it's with respect to its monthly numbers, it was at 3.48 million tons, uh, which grew 35% year on year. And its sales were at 4.1 uh, million tons. And then we come to the quarterly numbers with its production was at 10.7 million tons, which grew 20%. And again, sales also had a double digit growth of 45.5% year on year. Now, over 70% of its production came from this Chhattisgarh mines, while the other 30% came from its Karnataka mines. So, overall, we have seen a lot of records being broken and also multiple double-digit mm. growths uh, in this quarter until now. No, fantastic. And quite a few important updates there. I, I'm going to take uh, an important uh, update in terms of Altatex capacity utilization. Thanks so much, Rishi, for that, uh, for that uh, information. And all of these talks, uh, by the way, uh, ones that you should ideally watch out for in trade today. Uh, of course, we have to remember the late onset of the monsoons would also have had an impact on the demand for power and thereby uh, coal demand also would have also gotten impl in, uh, uh, impacted, impacted by that. Uh, we have a couple of order wins to tell you about. Saloni is joining in to tell you about those two companies. Morning, Saloni. Good morning. Uh, what do you have for us? So there were two companies notably who received big orders over the weekend, them being Mascon and NCC. So on the 30th of June, Mazgon Dock Shipbuilders signed a contract with the Indian Navy for medium refit come life certification of the second Shishumar class submarine INS Shankush. The contract value is Rs 2,724 crores. Speaking of NCC, they received two new orders worth a total of 2,055 crores from the private and state government agencies in the month of June. Out of these two orders, the first order is worth Rs 1,335 crores and is related to the building division. And the second order is for Rs 720 crores related to the electrical division. The time span for the execution of both of these orders is about 20 to 27 months. Okay. So, in fact, you know, apart from this, thank you, Saloni, for getting us these details on uh, closing day on, on Friday closing. We had a BEL also, which did see a good order win from the government. So, I think uh, good order wins that are coming in uh, from the government as well. And that's something uh, which is giving you an indication that the spending from the government side is also increasing. But apart from these talks, a lot of leadership changes, new appointments that have been on the cards, Alex. Now, what this would mean from a strategy perspective for the companies? We need to wait and watch. In fact, Himanch is joining us with more. Himanch, good morning. Good morning. Uh, what is on your radar? Because GHCL as well as uh, LNT uh, Finance, these two actually have caught my 
you know, have come attention, into yeah. attention as well. Mm -hmm. About, I mean, what is it that you're picking up? Right. Uh, so, firstly, GSCL's shareholders at their 40th AGM have rejected a resolution to reappoint its chairman, uh, Mr. Sanjay Dalmia, as a director for the company. Uh, the resolution only received 67.73% of the votes, falling short of the 75% mark required for it to be passed. It is worth noting that the investor advisory firm IIAS recommended voting against the reappointment of Mr. Dalmia as a non-executive, non-independent director for the company. In a note, the advisory cited some concerns regarding the company's corporate governance practices. Secondly, the SBI announced on Saturday that they are appointing Sri Kameshwar Rao as their new fi chief financial officer with effect from 1st of July. A chartered accountant by qualification, he has vast experience uh, in the fields of banking, forex, finance, so, and he has been associated with the bank for the past, uh, since 1991. Next, we also see LNT Finance Holdings announce their succession plans with their current MD and CEO, Mr. Dinanath uh, Dubashi. Yeah, will and he will be superannuating on 30th April 2024. Mr. Sudipta Roy from ICICI Bank will be taking on as a CEO, eventually rising through the ranks to the new MD and CEO position. He is expected to take on the role from January 24 onwards. And Mr. Dubashi, in the meantime, will be serving on the board and as a special advisor to the chairman in the meantime. Also, the RBI has approved the appointment of Mr. Hota as the part-time chairman of the Federal Bank from June 29 till uh, January 14 of 2026. He was previously serving as an independent director on board since January 2018. And last but not least, All Cargo Logistics has uh, informed their vice chairman and non-executive, non-independent director, Mr. P. V. Srinivasa, who has submitted his resignation and is going to be uh, re uh, relieving his duties from June 30th onwards. All right, Amash, thanks so much for those uh, updates. Uh, for me, uh, particularly, GHCL is important to watch very watch, closely yes. because this is another instance of investor activism. Uh, of course, not too much in the way of details from that IAS note that I was looking at yesterday, but they very clearly indicated that they would advise Twice, against. against right. uh, and, and with this one as well, with LNT over Morgan Stanley, yeah. which has actually maintained an equal weight on the same, and they have a target price of 105 on LNT Finance. Yeah. So that's going to be something we should be watching out for as well, Alex. Certainly, very quickly, uh, we've got uh, Mika joining in to tell us about a few block and bulk deals. What do you have for us today? So one could say it's been a season of block and bulk deals, and these were the um, four stocks that have been focused on trading Friday. Firstly, Adani Transmission Promoter Entity Fortitude and Trade Investment sold its entire stake in the company for about 2,665 crores. Um, around 3.2% of equity changed hands on Friday with GQG Partners buying stake worth 1,676 crores in the company, which amounts to about 1.9% stake. Um, the transaction was done at 786.19 apiece. Um, Prior to Friday's trading session, reports also said that TD Power Systems promoters were planning to um, offload 24% of the stake in the company. The shares were expected to be sold at a 4.12% discount to the Thursday's closing price for over 800 crores. As many as 3.72 crore shares, which is around 23.8% equity, changed hands on Friday during the pre-market opening session. Um, Thirdly, Easy Trip Planner Promoter sold a 5.75% stake through open market transactions on Friday, according to a disclosure by the company itself. Um, the company is a majority promoter-owned company with public shareholders only um, holding 25.1% stake in the company. Um, Credit Access Grameen Promoter, Credit Access BV, uh, will offload about 90 lakh shares, which is a 5.8% um, stake in the company for 1245.88 apiece. The size of the transaction is estimated to be around 1100 crores. Um, and currently, Credit Access India BV holds about 73.68% of the company. And um, lastly, um, 
Sirmas SGS Technology, South Asia Growth Fund 2 Holdings, sold around 1.6% stake in the company. Uh, the shares were sold at 439 apiece with Nomura Funds Island, um, PNB Paribas uh, Arbitrage, Employees Provident Fund being one of the buyers during the trade. Thanks, Pika, for getting us these details. And Alex, all these counters are actually indicating a positive start, at least in terms of pre-open. So it's going to be interesting to see how Adadi Transmission, as well as if you talk about the other names as well, Credit Access Group, mean, uh, open up and trade. Easy Trip Planners is interesting because clearly it's underperformed in the last one year. So that's going to be an interesting stock to watch out for. But apart from this, the last leg in terms of the show is a few other stocks which are important, which Varsha has been tracking as well. Varsha, good morning. Uh, which are the ones that you're focusing on today? Good morning, guys. So the other stocks that are on the list are, one is Vedanta. So a company is considering a potential strategic sale of its steel business to maximize shareholder value. The company has engaged advisors to assist in this review. Also, one, need, uh, one important uh, thing to note is SEBI has imposed a penalty of rupees 30 lakhs on the company for violating disclosure norms. Vedanta made in incorrect disclosures about its plan to enter into semiconductor business. The other one that we have is PVR INX. So, a uh, company has opened 15 screens across two new multiplexes with 10 screens in Delhi and 5 screens in Ahmedabad. Uh, the launch of these cinemas is in accordance with its uh, medium and long-term strategy to accelerate screen rollout across key markets. Uh, the last that we have is Aditya Birla Capital, which has completed 3,000 crores fundries. Uh, BlackRock, uh, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, and MIT were among, were among the key investors in the fundries. The funds were raised via Rs. 1,750 crore QIP and Rs. 1,250 crore preferential issues of equity shares. The preferential uh, equity shares were issued to Aditya Birla's Capital's promoter and promoter group entities, Glassim Industries Limited and Surya Kiran Investments Limited, respectively. Right, so lots to watch out for. And an interesting one over there will be, a, you know, to watch out for a Muthut mm. uh, Finance as well, because you have Muthut Microfin, uh, which will be filing a DR. Uh, be refiling actually a DRHP. So the impact on the stock is going to be important. But a quick update, Alex, in terms of the IPOs, you have Senko Gold and PKH Ventures that will be opening this week. Mm -hmm. And Idea Forge, uh, over 100 times subscription. And if you talk about a signed DLM, almost a little over 60 times is the kind of subscription that we've seen. IPO is coming back into focus as markets are at all time high. Speaking of which, you'll see the first few ticks in just a short while. So do stay tuned. This is BQ Prime.